You know the saying, sleeping with the enemy? Well, you may want to snuggle up and get nice and cozy with cortisol, because even though that we look at cortisol as a bad thing, you may want to buddy up with it, because I'm going to show you a thing or two about how cortisol is really your friend when it comes down to actually making it so you can perform at your best. Let's get down to the science of the adrenals and let's get down to the science of stress and cortisol. What I wanna talk about today is how stress directly impacts cortisol and how high cortisol levels affect you and how high cortisol levels ultimately turn into low cortisol levels which cause even more damage. And then lastly, at the end of this video, I'm gonna give you the main three causes of adrenal fatigue that directly have to do with your cortisol levels. But first and foremost, we have to understand what happens when we are under stress. See, it starts when we get stressed out. Our brain sends signals to a small gland that sits above the kidneys known as the adrenal gland. And that adrenal gland produces a lot of different catecholamines, okay? It produces a lot of different hormones. But for the sake of argument today, we're just gonna talk about three. The first one that it produces is adrenaline. We all know what adrenaline is. But what we don't really realize is that adrenaline really focuses on just a couple of things. Adrenaline is the fight or flight hormone response. Okay, it's the job of adrenaline to get you amped up, to get you that initial surge of energy that you need to get a job done. Then there's another catecholamine or hormone released, and that's called norepinephrine. Now, norepinephrine and adrenaline are very, very similar, but norepinephrine's job is more so to give you alertness, okay? Its job is to actually divert blood away from the organs and get you blood to where you need it right out the gate. Then, when we're stressed out, the third hormone that the adrenals produce is cortisol. This is the one that we all hear about, the one that we really don't give enough credit to because it's really more good than it is bad. It's really our own fault that it turns bad. What cortisol does is deliver glucose to the cells so that the cells can have energy. So when you get stressed out, it's like a three-part equation. Adrenaline gets you that initial surge. You can ride on adrenaline. It's like a fake energy that you get for a little bit. It's like artificial. Okay, norepinephrine diverts the blood away from the organs, out to the cells, out to the extremities. Then, as a result of the norepinephrine carrying the blood away, the cortisol increases blood glucose levels. So the cortisol increases the sugar in the blood so the norepinephrine can move the blood to get to the cells in your extremities so that you can burn the glucose and have energy to run away or fight or whatever you need to do. So you're not getting blood flow to your brain, that's for sure. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how this cortisol actually works in your body though. Cortisol also slows down other functions in the body. So it's gonna slow down your digestion, it's gonna slow down your immune system, it's gonna slow down your reproductive system. And the whole purpose of that is to make sure that your body is only focusing on what's important at a very given point in time. You don't need to be focusing on having sex when you are running from a tiger. But you can see how if we have chronically high levels of cortisol, that's not good. It's gonna make our immune system suppressed. It's gonna make it so we're not digesting food. It's gonna make it so we don't have a sex drive. It's gonna make it so our brain doesn't function well. But believe it or not, having a high level of cortisol isn't really the problem. It actually comes down to having lower levels of cortisol, which is called hypocortisol. Now, when you have low levels of cortisol, it's a direct result of having high levels of cortisol for too long of a period of time. Now, there's a couple of different reasons behind why you might ultimately end up with low cortisol, but most of them are pretty much hypothesized. We don't really know a solid way that this is happening or solid reasoning, but it's been shown in a few studies to have to do with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is the communication between the pituitary and the adrenals. When your cortisol levels are super high for an extended period of time, you start to wear out that axis, so the brain no longer gets a chance to really communicate with the adrenals very well. Now we have to remember that cortisol is also all about homeostasis. You see, we always give cortisol this bad name, like we always think it's just terrible, but in reality, when cortisol goes up, other hormones go down. When cortisol goes down, other hormones go up. You see, it's always just a balancing act, and cortisol weighs a lot more. Cortisol can weigh down and cause other hormones to go way up. And when it's up, the other hormones go way down. So you can see how if cortisol levels are elevated, then it's throwing off that balance. But if cortisol levels are low, it's also throwing off that balance. You see, cortisol really holds the power to keep our body in a positive state as well, too. So if we have it too low, it's just as bad as if it's too high. But why exactly does cortisol get low, and why is it almost worse than having cortisol that's too high? Well, you see, high cortisol levels over an extended period of time will cause brain damage. They can actually cause your brain to not function very well. Now, a couple of doctors, Hellhammer and Wade, actually did a study a few years ago, and they found that very much so, cortisol did affect the brain. So they saw that it was actually a down-regulation process to protect the brain. When cortisol levels were high for extended periods of time, eventually the body steps in and says, wait a minute, this is gonna start becoming damaging to the brain. And we almost like have this physiology built in that tells us it is bad to be stressed out. We shouldn't be stressed out that 
much. Now, the other thing we have to look at is corticotropin releasing factor downregulation. Now, that is a big mouthful to say. Corticotropin releasing factor is actually a component of cortisol in and of itself. You see, we have different CRF receptors on all of our cells. And we have cortisol levels that are elevated for an extended period of time we end up having what is known as downregulation. It's basically where these receptors that are used to receiving cortisol get so used to receiving cortisol that they no longer receive it anymore. So therefore, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis isn't receiving the cortisol like it should. But what happens then? Well, because it's not receiving the cortisol that it normally would, it actually becomes very sensitive to cortisol. So you have this axis that's completely thrown off. So then when you do get stressed out, the brain overcompensates and produces too much cortisol at any given point in time. So you have these big spikes and these big crashes. That's why once you become a stressed out person, they say you have a short fuse because it really does happen. You end up developing a quicker stress response because the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and the corticotropin releasing factor down regulation is absolutely screwing you over. All right, now let's talk real quick the basics. What is causing all of this? And this is simple. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this. The biggest one is emotional stress, okay? And it's how we perceive that stress. Studies have shown that our perception of stress dictates what levels of cortisol are released. So that means if you're excited or you're really getting ambitious about something and you're releasing cortisol because you're excited, it's gonna have a different effect on your brain. It's gonna have a different effect on your CRF receptors than it would if you were negatively stressed out from some kind of emotional trauma. Now, we can't always avoid emotional trauma, but we can control how we react to it. And that's the big thing. If we can control how we react to emotional trauma, we can control how long our cortisol levels stay elevated. Because if there's anything that you're learning from this video, it's that cortisol levels should not be elevated for too long of a period of time. Okay, the next big one is sleep. Sleep resets our corticotropin releasing factor regulation. Basically, it makes it so that your body can respond to cortisol better. Remember, you don't want to not have a response to cortisol, you want to have a good response to cortisol. So adequate sleep is gonna make a big, big impact on this. And believe it or not, you can catch up on sleep. Studies have shown that if you actually catch up on sleep one day per week and get a few extra hours, you can actually recap and help some of the neuroplasticity and help some of the receptors simply by catching up on sleep. Lastly, the big one is sugar. Okay, remember how I mentioned that cortisol works directly with glucose? Okay, well glucose also works directly with cortisol. Every time we get a major sugar high and we have that massive amount of inflammation coming in the body, it skews our brain's ability to communicate with the adrenal glands. And if there's anything again that you're learning from this video, it's that axis, that communication between the pituitary and the adrenals that is so important. Inflammation clouds the phone line. The phone line doesn't work well, which means the brain can't send the signal, which means the signal isn't getting to the adrenals and the adrenals aren't producing enough cortisol. And therefore, you're ending up in that hypocorticoid state where you're in trouble. Now, I know this isn't the answer to all of your problems, but one of the biggest things that you can start doing is making sure that you're getting enough potassium, enough sodium, enough magnesium, and keeping track of your minerals, because that's the biggest way that you're gonna be able to help out your body produce enough of the cortico minerals that it needs to produce, the aldosterone that it needs to produce, and of course, the norepinephrine and the adrenaline. So I know I've thrown a lot of terminology at you, but as always, I wanna give you the science, and I wanna help you understand what's gonna work for you. Keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you in the next video.